It is seven o'clock. We will open up the May 10th, 2023 Town of Littleton Board of Health meeting uh, with a 7, 7 p.m. public hearing on 26 Tehadawan Road featuring Mark Elbag, MA Elbag Engineering Inc., with a variance request on a proposed subsurface sewage disposal system. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and promote you to a panelist. All right, thank you for having me. You should be able to see and hear me now. Hi, Mark. Yeah, we can see you. Could you just state your name and address for the record? Yep, Mark Elbag, uh, MA Elbag Engineering, 188 Glenwood Road, Rutland, Mass. Thank you. Do you have a plan you can share with us? And... Yeah, here on behalf of the applicant at 26 to Hattel 1. Uh, if you'd like, I can share a screen. Unless you have it in front of you, I can walk through it. Uh, please, please share it. That'd, that'd be great. Yeah. So tell me if you can see that now. All right, so here we go. Uh, I'm zoomed in on the plan view of the septic. If you'd like, I can take you back a little bit further. There's the, the entire septic design is one sheet. Uh, and I'll just for presentation purposes, I'll zoom in on the actual plan view of the system. Uh, this hill, this system is on a lot that's a little bit tough due to groundwater and soil conditions. We have limited area to work with. Uh, so the, the reason we're here is there's an impervious barrier incorporated into the design on the low side of the system. We're proposing a new septic tank in, the, in close proximity to the existing on the front side of the house. From the tank, it'll go to a pump chamber and be pumped up to a Presby, Presby style soil absorption system. Uh, and we've been able to fit that on the side yard of the house. And what you can't see here or maybe appreciate here from this plan view is as you get close to Tatawan Road, there is, some, there is a very steep embankment. Uh, there's some large trees that we're trying to save as many as we can. And um, really a pretty limited area, much more limited than it may look on this, uh, on this sheet of paper. But so we kind of shoehorn this in here uh, for minimal disturbance and to avoid, uh, you know, large tree clearing in the rear of the lot. So we got this to fit in pretty nice. And again, we're here because of the impervious barrier. Uh, I've included the impervious barrier detail down here below as well. So I think with that, I'll happily entertain any questions or however you would like to uh, move forward. Thanks, Mark. Did you have to notify abutters? Yes, abutters have been notified. Yep. Okay. And have you have you turned in the the receipts to to Brenda at the at the front desk? Yes, it's been uh, everything was sent over electronically. It was it's been a while now. We were on the cusp of making it for last meeting, but we just because of a scheduling snafu, we ended up delaying it. So it's everything's been in for some time now. Great. Uh, first, I'll go ahead and read Jim's notes, and this is, uh, you know, I don't know if he's got notes on uh, what's ahead of here. Yeah, he doesn't have any notes on Tahadawa here, but I think we've done this enough that we can uh, go around the board and ask some questions. Um, sorry, Dan, you look confused. Did you, did you see notes? Might have his notes handy. I'm just looking here. I don't see him in my file. No, he does have notes. I remember. I remember one note being the tank elevation, but other than that, I was just trying to find. Oh, oh yeah, it's down at the bottom of the page. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so these are the notes from our health agent Jim Gariffi, uh, 26 to Hadwin Road. The sewage disposal system for this house has failed the Title Five inspection. The inspector noted the distribution box has been surcharged. Evidence in the box noted the water level was above outlet pipes. 
Soil testing was conducted and the elevated seasonal high water table prevented a perk test from being conducted. A soil sample was taken for a sieve analysis. There's a curtain drain above the existing leaching area location to help divert water around the system. And though it is difficult to determine if the drain is still functioning properly, the proposed replacement system will be placed below the area of the drain to provide additional protection from the high groundwater. The area for the proposed leaching system slopes to the road in an effort to minimize the grading needed. The applicant is requesting a reduction in the groundwater offset from four feet to three feet and approval of a poly barrier. The area is served by town water and there are no wetlands on the site. The requested local upgrade approvals are necessary to help determine a perk rate for the system and minimize the fill needed for the proposed system. I believe the design represents a reasonable solution for the replacement of this failed system. Uh, so we will uh, we'll go around here. Uh, we'll go in reverse order. Matt Wason, any, any questions, comments? Good evening, I can't sir. hear you. I can't hear you this too is, well, Matt. This is Gino. How are you? Hi, Gino. Hang on. We'll be right with you. I can't hear you. No. Microphone. Uh, we'll come back to you, Matt. Uh, Dan Kane, any questions? Um, just a, a kind of a quick one. It looks like this lot on their plan is two and a half acres or 2.4 acres. And certainly looking from the satellite look, view, it looks like there's a good part of that backyard that's cleared. Um, I know you wanted to try to avoid tree clearance, but I guess I'm trying to figure out whether options in the backyard, in that clear, in the clear area of the backyard that may have had a lower water table and may have been able to avoid a few of these variances and the, and the fill within 10 feet and concerns uh we didn't look too much in the backyard there were a lot of uh conflicts in the back i i'm just trying to pull up the aerial here i think there was a swimming pool in the backyard and then beyond that was all wooded and it there wasn't really a good a good location that we found uh i would expect high groundwater throughout the lot so i think no matter where we put it there'd be a significant fill for the system um so to answer your question it wasn't there wasn't an in-depth evaluation in the back. Uh, we were looking at something that would be a constructible replacement system or as constructible as possible. And that's how we ended up in this, uh, in the front yard area in a similar location to the existing system. Okay, I was gonna say, there's no certainly, there's no pool or anything listed here and I don't see anything on the satellite, but it may have gone in after the satellite photos were done. Um, yeah, me, as certain, that's that's kind of my only concern. I understand you want to kind of keep it in the same place, but certainly with such a big lot without a really good reason, I guess I'm wondering, you know, other options at least looked at before coming coming forward with a number of variances if there were potentially other ones. This looks like this is built basically between 308 and 312. As soon as you get, you know, 30 feet behind the house, you're up at 318. So again, I don't know what the water table would be, but there's certainly a, you know five or six feet higher ground level. I don't know what the water table would be back there, but that just be kind of be my question of were, were there other options even explored before you coming forward with a number of various requests? We did we did look at other options, but we were really trying to keep it uh, a reasonable at a reasonable cost for the. To the owner as it is i think they're going to have trouble uh affording this reconstruction and i don't, I don't know that they'll even be moving forward right away but this was pretty much deemed the the least cost alternative and um it, a lot of those requests help save on ultimate cost of the system this cost is certainly something we can consider and we do consider, but obviously as, as an engineer, you know, the goal is to be as compliant as possible with title five. So, okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. Um, Matt Wason, are you, are you back? I don't know. Am I? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, sorry. Could you just uh, zoom out one tick on the drawing here? Yep. Absolutely. So I just want to identify it's the driveways at the North end. Correct. Correct. We're on the opposite side of the lot. Okay, so the driveway's up there. And then um, 
the dark line at the bottom is the property line that's going to cross? Yes. Yep. Because it looks like on the, uh, I was looking at the road map, there is like a separate side road down there that's further away. Or is yes. It a long that's, driveway? That's, there's a long driveway to the south, okay. and um, there's also a power easement to the south. So okay, there is but some, that, that's not on the drawing because I think that's quite a bit further away from the property line, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, And then my only other question, if you could zoom back in, is how close are we to the road from the impervious barrier or the front of that system? Let me, uh, I'll scale that now. I don't know if I see that measurement on there. Grab that, hang on one second. Let me just check the scale. The barrier to the property line is approximately 16 or 17 feet. Okay. And the, then to the edge of pavement is about 32. Okay. Um, those were my questions. Thank you. Uh, Gino Fredoloni, any questions, well, comments? Well, uh, the question is, he's got a, a lot of land there, and he, I'm sure that he's about 10 feet away from the, the, the neighbor. I don't see why he has to have some many problems. Regulation 22. What the hell is it? He's got the septic system, right? He's got everything there, right? So why you guys gave him so much trouble? What what the, the Jimmy says? Oh, I, I didn't <clears> have a chance because I came five minutes late here. What does he say about the variance? He's going to build a wall too, any? he? No, it's just for the poly barrier. He's just asking for see. variances. What does uh, the gym say? All right. The, and the grading is just to, the actual limit of grading is, is over 10 feet from the front line and about 15 feet from the sideline, if that helps. Uh, Kevin Davis, questions, comments? Yeah, I'd like to express uh, some concerns. Um, I would definitely like to express the concern, uh, that Dan had about, um, moving it back farther, uh, to raise it up naturally from the water table. Again, not knowing where the water table is in the back. So I would express that concern. Um, the next concern is if we're going to keep it where it is, definitely putting some more detail about where the, how far away it is from the property line. Cause I don't see Phil. So one of the variances you said is you're putting fill in 10 feet within a property line. Um, but I'm not seeing any gradients for the fill. No, I, I don't think we're within 10 feet. We're right at the 10 foot mark. Okay. So the only variance then would be the poly barrier. And the sieve analysis. Oh, and the sieve analysis. Right, right, right. Because of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, are those variances listed anywhere on the on the drawing on the print? Uh, let me check. I did issue a uh, variance request letter. Um, I usually put them on the model space. I don't believe they are, but I can certainly add them. Yeah, um, and then um, is the is, you said there's a pool on the property? Uh, I might have misspoke. There were, it's been a long time since I was out there because funding has been an issue here, but there was a, I remember there was a bunch of stuff in the backyard that made it difficult. Um, some sheds and garage and uh, fences and stuff like that. So that's, that's why we deemed this was the most open area to construct the system. But Okay. I, I've got, issues that it doesn't look like there was a test pit or any other thing done farther up the slope to see what's going on. So that's my issue. All right. Thank you. I understand costs are concern. I get it. That's just my one thing. Thank you. My comment is I'm wondering why you didn't go with a lower profile system like a geomat and, um, you know, take advantage of the groundwater offset. 
with that with with no wetlands being around because it seems like if you would do that you would you know maybe eliminate the need for that pump and uh sort of work it into the, the topography but i'm at, I'm, at, I'm asking I'm yeah we were we we were originally hoping we could avoid the pump but it um we just couldn't so close get it to work. so close yeah it was it was really close we just couldn't get it to work i'm going back to the elevations here uh, like what if you fed it from the or you yeah, we, step it down right that's why you're, you're stepping yeah, it we, down that's why you're using the present yeah yeah we looked at um right the reason for the presby is we're, we're following the contours of the hill to avoid the yeah. the large fill on the downhill side and originally i thought there was a chance we, we could get this without pumping but we just couldn't couldn't quite get there the other issue we were fighting is some uh utility conflicts in the front yard. What did the stiff come back rated? It came back as a class two, so we're designed for a 30 minute rate. Okay. And what was the estimated high groundwater called at? It is 30 inches. Okay. And why not go from a, why not go to a two foot groundwater offset? Uh, I was, you know, either way, it's a pump system. I didn't feel that we needed it, and the the Presby seemed to fit in there nicely. So I, I, I kind of stuck with three and okay in the barrier and and went from there. But the idea you know, was take a client some money on the pump and then the, you know the fill if you, if you look at well, it. there was there was no way we were getting out of the pump, but um okay, okay. we you know okay. we. We could drop another foot potentially with that Presby two foot groundwater offset instead of three, if uh, if the board is so inclined. Well, I was just curious. Um, so we are we're looking at a sieve analysis, and we're looking at a groundwater offset uh, from four feet to three feet right now. Um, are there any abutters in the audience? Please raise your hand now. All right. So a, a, a point on yeah, that, I think, as Kevin was pointing out, our, our packet doesn't include a, a list of the variance request. Well, it does. It includes his request letter, but it, um, it's omitted uh, regarding the sieve analysis. And that often happens. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe folks that are coming to Littleton don't know that that's a requirement that we have, or, or is that a Title V requirement, Mark? Teach me. Uh, the sieve is Title V. I, I should have put that on there. Yeah. The um, the barrier is what caught me a little off guard with the local because that normally doesn't require uh, yep. a butter notification, but it does in Littleton. I, I guess my point is, point me to where it could be. All I see in our packet is the letter to about notification of a butters. Yes. Which is where the confusion raised because it says the design incorporates an impervious barrier to limit the amount of fill, fill but it's but it's fall, falling under the regulation of retaining wall and fill to a yeah. property line. So I think that's where the confusion is. And then there's nothing that, like you said, points out the four foot to three foot offset in the sieve analysis, right? Well, the the right. four foot to three foot because it's a presby is, I believe, approved without a variance. It's a little gray, and every town handles it differently. So in this case, really the only the only true title I five variance is the sieve analysis, and then the barrier is a local uh, regulation, because otherwise that complies with title five. But there is a local yeah. The sieve, uh, the sieve I believe, is a local. The sieve is a local upgrade approval. So is the groundwater reduction. So it should be stated in here. Um, you know, I'd like to keep your project moving and not you know, hold you guys up on little intricacies here, but the devil is in the details, so. Yeah, I um, certainly have no problem adding it to the plan too and resubmitting. Okay. If that, if that helps um, as a condition. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll, make, a, I'll make a motion to uh, grant the variance for the civ analysis and the poly barrier uh, and the reduction uh, to the groundwater offset from four feet to three feet, uh, given Jim's review of the final, uh, final plan. On this. I second. Uh, you, you want to... 
Uh, we have a motion and a second, a roll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fratelloni. Gino Fratelloni, yes. As long as, as long as he followed the, the extra thing that he has to do. Dan, Dan Kane, yes. Matt Wason. Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Uh, thanks, Mark. Have a nice night. All right. Thank you, folks. You too. Appreciate it. So we'll move Thank on to our 710, 710 public hearing for 61 Oak Hill Road with Chris McKenzie of Dillis and Roy, design, civil design group uh, for a local upgrade approval and local regulations variance requests. Chris, I'm promoting you as a panelist now. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Chris. How are you? Uh, I'd like Could to you please state. Your, yeah, just state your name and the address for the record, and please share. Yeah, my name is Chris McKenzie from Dillis and Roy. Uh, our address is One Main Street in Lundberg. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Be a little easier to show you what's going on. Yes, please. Uh, All right, can you see that okay? Yes. All right, this uh, property is located at 61 Oak Hill Road in Littleton. Uh, some, most of you are probably familiar with it. It's the, it's the only house on the right-hand side as you're heading out of town. Uh, this uh, town of uh, Littleton Conservation Land that completely surrounds it uh, on three sides. And then there's, a, I think, a subdivision or something uh, on the other side of the road. Uh, from it, but it's really the only house on this side of the road. It's been there for quite some time. Has an existing well located here with an existing leach area located here uh, that didn't pass a Title V inspection. Uh, I believe the owner is looking to sell the property, so he's required to upgrade the system. Um, so it's an existing two bedroom house. Uh, it's very steep. If you look, uh, we're at 182 down here by the road. And we're at 199 on the other side of the system. So that's 17 feet of rise in about uh, 60 or 70 feet. So it's, it's pretty, very steep along here. <clears throat> we ended up putting in the poly barrier with the two to one slope uh, coming down from it. Uh, we tried to do the regular breakout with three to one slope and the fill went down across Oak Hill Road and onto the neighbor across the street. Uh, so that was pretty unreasonable. Uh, same thing happens if you try to do a conventional system uh, so we went with the Presby system here to take advantage of, of their ability to allow for a steep slope. I think we were somewhere around uh, 16, 15% uh, slope on the system, which is higher than we usually do. We try to usually keep it under the 10%. Um, so we're asking for a couple of local uh, upgrade approvals and one uh, uh, local variance. Uh, we're asking for a reduction in the four foot separation between the estimated high groundwater table and the bottom of the leach area. We're proposing a three foot. Uh, a seven analysis was performed uh, because the percolation could not be performed uh, due to wet conditions at the time of testing. Uh, we're asking for the reduction of the required 12 inch separation between the tank inlet and outlet tees and the estimated seasonal high groundwater table. Uh, less than 12 inches is proposed. It's actually gonna be a little below the water table um, in case anybody wanted to ask that question that usually gets asked. And then uh, we're asking for the local variance uh, for a less than 10 feet to a property line. And it's going to be about five feet. And it's in this area right along here. This is all you can see. It's a very steep slope all through here. The, this is the town of Littleton land. And this is a spot where it's all rocky and ledgy and it looks like, I don't know, maybe probably has a lot of runoff when it rains out, I would suspect. Um, so there was a lot of rock and ledge out here. Uh, it was very rocky up in this back part, which again is another 10 or 15 feet higher in elevation. Um, so that really wasn't a reasonable place. And of course you got a hundred foot well radius here that we had to keep out of. Uh, so this is pretty limited. Uh, it's gonna be a pump system as well. Uh, we're, we're pumping almost 22 feet uh, from the pump up to the uh, leach area. So it's a pretty hefty, uh, 
situation. I think we ended up having to go with a one horsepower pump on that. Um, hey, I will uh, go ahead and read Jim Griffey, Jim Griffey's comments on this. 61 Oak Hill Road, the sewage disposal system at this site would fail a Title V inspection based on the seasonal high water table noted when soil evaluation was conducted. The water table is very high on the site, which means the existing leaching area would be in the high water table. As mentioned above, the soil testing revealed a very high seasonal water table, 12 inches below grade. For this reason, a PERC test could not be conducted and the soil sample was taken for sieve analysis. In addition to the high water table, the site has other constraints which make it challenging to design a replacement system in full compliance with your regulations in Title V. There's an on-site well with the lot and the lot slopes to the road. The, we the well restricts the location on which the leaching area can be placed on the lot and the slope makes it difficult to achieve the necessary grading for leaching area before property line before property line and the house. The applicant is requesting a number of local upgrade approvals, sieve analysis due to the wet soil, a reduction in the groundwater offset for leaching area, three feet instead of four feet to help lower the system and reduce the final grading, and the offset of the tank outlets to the groundwater. The outlets for septic tank and pump chamber are located at the level of groundwater. The applicant also needs a variance to your local regulations for the placement of fill within 10 feet of the lot lines. Based on the raised system, the minimum grading needed and the location of the leaching area, this is unavoidable. The applicant needs approval for the use of a poly barrier. This also helps to reduce the grading footprint. The design of the replacement system is challenging because of the high water table noted the proposed design is, re is a reasonable solution for the addressing the failed system. So let's go around for comments from the board. Uh, Matt Wason. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree. This is a, a very creative solution here on such a slope. Um, I think the key question for me is, is the outlets of the tanks, I think, is, is where I hang up the most. And in looking at this, it looks like you're already changing the plumbing in the basement to meet this design. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, the, the plumbing comes out the other end of the building, um, and it's uh, uh, in pretty rough shape. Uh, there isn't much left. The, the house is probably going to need some serious amount of work in there. Um, so, so what I, the only the, thing that I'm thinking is, what would what would it look like if the tank and the pump chamber were off the northeast wall of the house instead of the southeast, basically? At, and based upon that slope, could you end up getting those high enough that they're a little further away from the groundwater? No, the problem is the, the finished floor elevation of the house. That's what's dictating the elevation of the pipe coming out. So if we put the pipe coming out of the back of the house, the tank and pump chamber are actually going to be deeper in the ground and more into the water table. We're on the, we're on the low side and we're filling to accommodate that, uh, the new tank and pump chamber. So we're actually in a sense, creating more of a separation. Than it, because if we put it on the other side, you're going uphill um, and you can't raise the tank. If we could raise the tank, then I'd raise the tank out front, but we, we can't based on the finished floor elevation of the house. Well, well, what I'm saying is, would you consider raising the tank and then having a pump to get into the tank? You can't do that. 25% is the maximum you can pump into a septic tank. 25% of the total flow of the house is the maximum you can pump into a septic tank. That allows you to have a bathroom in the basement with a pump, pump grinder that pumps up to the tank, but it doesn't allow the whole house to, uh, okay. that's 100% and you can't do that. Not allowed. Okay. okay. Um, Dan Kate, questions, comments? Um, it's a tough one on a small lot. It's, I don't have any questions. Uh, Gino Fredoloni, questions, comments? At this moment, I, I, he's doing the best he can. So it's only two bedroom. And I, I'm sure because of the septic system, if you, if you want him to do better on a septic system or put a pump there, ask him to do that. Uh, Chris, is this uh, Kevin Davis? Questions, comments? Yeah, I got a couple. Um, so, uh, I acknowledge that this is a very tough uh, property area to be putting this in. Um, my first question is, what's the local regulation on having the tanks 
within the 100 foot buffer zone. I thought we had to, and I know it's the leaching field, but um, don't the tanks have to be outside as well, or do they have to be sealed tanks to be inside the 100 foot? Sealed. So, Chris, what's the Title Five rule on, on Title tanks? Five, Title Five rule on all tanks is 50 feet from a well. Um, okay. The, the boots and connections on all these will have to be, you know, watertight sealed connections anyways because of the proximity to the groundwater yeah. uh, re requests that we have. Yeah, is that, or is that dictated on the prints? I don't see that dictated on the prints that they have to be sealed. Uh, it, yeah, it's it, probably in some of the construction notes somewhere. Uh, it's it's uh, a standard, okay, a I standard didn't, note thing. I didn't see it. Uh, the next thing is... So no, the, no 10. Oh, no 10. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, the next thing is I noted that there's a, uh, PVC check valve, um, in the pump chamber. Is that going to be enough to handle the backflow pressure coming from the DI box back down with the amount of flow that's in the pipe? That check valve isn't to stop the flow from coming back into the pump chamber. The pump chamber actually has to be designed, uh, for storage and, in that storage amount, you have to include the flow back from the pipe. So the check valve isn't there to stop it from uh, flowing. It stops it from flowing back into the pump, but there's a weep hole above the che check valve that drains the pipe out. You can't leave the pipe charged full of water because that can freeze. Oh, okay, because I didn't see the weep hole that's on the, on the drawing, so that's why I was yeah. asking the question. Yeah, it should uh, be a, a quarter-inch drilled weep hole right there. Right, at, right before the pipe oh. goes down the tank, there's a weep hole, and then the check valve you're talking about is down below that. So yeah, the water is right see back it. the weep you. hole and not back into the pump. Yep, yep. Okay, good. Thank you. I didn't see the weep hole. My, my error on that. Um, other than that, um, no other questions. Thank you. Uh, Chris, what, what did the sieve analysis come back rated at? It came back as a class two, so it's a 30 minute per inch. And did you did you test in the in the front yard? Front yard, like where? we're you know around like one eighty five. No, uh, you can see there is another set of test holes. We did four yeah. test holes here in all. Uh, test they all holes look bad. Four were not very good holes. Yeah. Um, they, they couldn't really establish well on the groundwater elevation. Yeah. Uh, they, they, well, I think both Jim and our soil evaluator uh, deemed those holes as not very good, so they went up uh, to the holes further up. Any further down would have just caused more more trouble on the roadside anyways. Yeah. The water table. And uh, no town water on Oak Hill Road, right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, have these yeah. folks have these folks uh, tested their their well water recently? I don't know if they have. Is the home habitable? Good. Somebody lives there. Uh, there's nobody living there now that I'm aware of. Yeah. That's good. Um, okay. It was pretty empty when I was on site. There was nothing in the house. Okay. Um, does anyone have a motion? Question just before that, yeah. because we're within the property line, but it's conservation land. Oh, right. That's my other question. There's, there's no, I mean, there's no butter to to address. How, do, how does does the conservation? Yeah, have, you been, have you been to Conscom yet? Uh, we have no need to file with them. We're, we're not in any wetland areas. We file nothing with them. Yeah, they're just the abutter. Right. Right. Yeah. And conserv was conservation notified? Yes. What, what was their what was their response? I I didn't get any response. No response. They're, they're just in a bottle. There's no wetlands. There's no uh, required offsets or regulations mm -hmm. regarding being a butter to to them. 
Yeah, just I guess my point is one of the variances is, is, is fill within 10 feet of a property line and the property line is conservation land. Therefore, right. were they notified properly and did they say, yeah, like we have no debate with that because they're not here in our meeting, correct? Right. Right. Yeah. Did you, uh, so you notified the, the abutters though? Yeah. Yep. Do you have the receipts? Uh, I don't have them uh, with me. I can uh, certainly get them. Okay. Yeah, if you could office. if you could turn those into Brenda, that that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, I may may have already done it. We were supposed to be on at the last meeting, and uh, something happened with that. So. Okay. All right. Is there any, uh, anyone have a, a motion here? Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, grant the variances for the sieve analysis, the ground water reduction from four feet to three feet and the use of a poly barrier with fill within 10 feet of a property line, as long as Mr. McKenzie uh, produces the uh, notifications uh, to the abutter um, and approval from Jim on the, on the final design. I'll second Off that. Of the, I'm going to make offset a set of the tanks. Tank outlets for the groundwater. Oh, second. yeah, and and the offset of, of the uh, the tanks being in the um, being in the groundwater mm -hmm. uh, with the proper boots on the junctions. Okay, Mr. Chairman, is that, I'm going to only suggest that gentlemen. That I know it's only two bedroom, and also they have a, no water from the town, but they're going to have a well. To advise the whoever's going to mo move in to have the water checked, okay, before they use it, because the only water they're going to have, unless they're going to use it just to to water the land. Uh, Did you second? I second it. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Um, Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fadaloni. Gino Fadaloni, yes. Dan Kane. And Kane, yes. And Matt Wason? Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Let you me, too. Uh, Thanks. Pull out on your screen here. So we'll move on to our 720 public hearing, the Model Board of Health Regulations for Private Wells, adopting model re well regulations with additions specific for the town of Littleton. Um, I hope you guys all have a packet in front of you or accessible. Um, I did sit down with Jim and go over the model well regulations with the instruction that we want to sort of start with the, the model regulations right. and input anything a uh, little tin specific. Um, so I'm just going to flip through the document I have and read off some page numbers and sections and uh, we can talk through this. It's not uh it's not very, it's not too cumbersome. Um, so, so page two in the, in the definition section, um, actually the first definition of abandoned water well, uh, Jim recommends that uh, on point three, the well has been out of service for at least three years. Uh, he recommends we adjust that to one year to bring it uh, in line with uh, Littleton standards. Uh, the, the next thing that, that we have to do uh, is on page three uh, in regards to irrigation wells uh, is specifically call out an agricultural irrigation well, um, define it, and, and Jim's going to uh, work on getting that language for us, I think from either Stowe or maybe Harvard, uh, but to be input into this section to include things like uh, managing livestock and uh, being produce providers and things like that, which would qualify the individual as, as an agricultural irrigation well user. Um, Kevin Davis, I did refer to your note regarding geothermal wells, and we will get into that, but they do fall into the private well definition on page four. Uh, where it says transfer heat, uh, but we will get more in depth in that uh, later on in the in the regulations. Uh, moving on to sec section four on page five, uh, the well construction permit. 
um, Jim strongly recommends that um, in section two or thereabouts, we add a line um, in case of emergency, if someone's well has been, um, you know, contaminated or uh, is at the point to where they need emergency relief and need to drill a new well. Uh, that as long as Jim has all the documentation um, that in case of emergency, you know, we would allow someone to go in and, and drill a well um, without checking off some of these boxes. Yeah. I, I guess what what is he concerned about specifically in there that might be time consuming in an emergency? Well, there is a. Let's see where that line is. Bear with me. So it refers actually if it refers way deeper into the document. Um, page 18 uh, in the is it, um, my Roman numerals aren't great. Is it 55, the variance section? Uh, page 18? 15, 15, yep. Page 18, variances. Okay, 15, thank you. Um, in paragraph two, uh, where it states um, at least 10 days prior to the submission of the application to the board, that's that's where Jim was concerned about giving us some flexibility on the emergency use should someone need to get a well in, you know, right away. So they have potable water. Okay. That, that makes more sense to me. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to this page uh, later on. Um, but the next item is number six, well location and use requirements. Um, Jim says we should just import the existing, um, setbacks that Littleton has. Um, like for now, we have 50 feet from a property line, uh, 25 feet from a public or private roadway, and 15 feet from a right of way. Um, so I think that, that 50 feet from the property line is, a, is the big one that should, that should remain. Um, as far as water quantity requirements on page seven, section seven, um, there's just a lot of new language there. <clears throat> and includes a table on the following page, page eight, uh, which really calls out and specifies, you know, number of bedrooms. Here's what your flow rate has to be, uh, number of bathrooms. And, and as you can see, you know, as the number of bedrooms gets larger and the number of bathrooms gets larger, the, uh, the flow rate in gallons per minute gets larger. So it just means that people have enough, not only quality water, but quantity of water. Um, so Jim suggested we utilize this section as well. Uh, another big change would be the water quality testing requirements on page 10, uh, where we're basically adding in uh, radon, gross alpha, PFAS, um, just making it a more robust testing process. Um, on the following page, page 11, there are... Uh, new points, uh, specifically calling out point number six um, regarding rental properties needing to have their water tested once a year. Um, number seven would be a new requirement for us as well, uh, making the test, uh, the results of the test available. And this will all sort of work into our OpenGov permitting system, you know, uploading results and making sure they're attached to certain files and records. Um, number eight, prior to selling, conveying or transferring title to real property, the owner shall have tested the water of every private drinking well serving that property. That would be a, another uh, new point that our residents would need to be notified about. Um, so we could you know, send some educational information to residents with private, drink, private drinking water wells. Um, well, right, right, the testing requirements for all properties, not just rental properties. Right. Yeah. The, the, uh, we don't have any requirement right now, correct? So yeah, the, yeah. The rental property is an annual test, uh, whereas you know it's it's upon sale with a regular 
you know, single family. Home. No section section six right there says the owner of every well used for drinking water, including those serving a property, which is rented or leased. So that says to me all. Uh, Jim referred to that to me uh, just as rental property, not. And that, but that's not, not what the words say, right? It's a, yeah. I mean, it's, it depends who you're talking to. The owner of every well used for drinking water. Yeah, get rid of, so so I agree with Matt on this. If you say, you get rid of including those, because that's a parenthetical. You say, yeah. the owner of every well used for drinking water shall have its water tested at a Massachusetts certified library, blah, 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 blah. That's, yeah. So take out including those. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Perfect. That's good. Yeah, I, I would like to discuss that point further, but we yeah, can come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, so if we take that out, that removes the test requirement for everyone except for rentals. On an no, annual basis. No. If we take... Yeah. All I'm saying is... If we take out including those, then if the owner of every well used for drinking water... Serving a property which is rented or leased will have its water tested by a lab. Yeah, yeah. So that means the only annual testing requirement for, would be for those properties which are rented or leased, which would mean a private house, a private owner does not need to test their well ever. Once it's once it's in place and it's approved, they never ever have to test it again unless they sell it. C section eight, yeah. The, the where where right. Transferring title to a real property comes into play, and then it has to be tested. Um, Is that a good thing? Yeah, that's it's. I mean, that's open for discussion. Yeah. And there's a couple. There's a couple points in here that we're going to need to, you know, really dive into. Um, you know, and that, and then maybe that happens tonight, or maybe it happens, you know, at a following meeting. I, w I think um, let's go through these and see what what we want to do um section uh so number 10 for irrigation wells the board requires annual testing for e coli bacteria and nitrate as accidental consumption could result in acute exposure jim says this is a little bit extreme to have irrigation wells tested for such things um you know it's probably something we We'll discuss and and vote on. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, just other things that are important going down the line on on page twelve. Um, actually, number thirteen is is adopted and in use as part of Littleton's existing well regulations. Um, number three down under well construction requirements a physical connection is not permitted between water supply which satisfies the requirements of these regulations and another water supply that does not meet the requirements of these regulations without prior approval from the board it's an important one and jim suggested that um we add a section yeah in the well construction requirements section calling it number 10 uh, in regards to geothermal well constructions um, get it defined in here and refer back to the, the state guidelines for geothermal wells. Um, and also he suggests and recommends we uh, only allow closed loop geothermal so that the water you're pulling up for the geothermal doesn't get mixed in to your potable your drinking water. Um, so the allowance of only closed loop, no open loop systems. And I don't even know if anybody does open loop systems around here, but no dual use is what is what he calls for in the geothermal. Or if it's going to be a dual use system, you have to follow the drinking water guidelines. Yeah. yeah, but he just said, don't like that, you know, then you're going and you're inspecting dual uses and, um, you know, just make it known that, you know, only closed loop systems should be allowed. Um, and then, yeah, back to that variance section, section 15, um, paragraph two, basically taking out from 
after the in the taking out starting at the third sentence at least 10 days prior all the way through to uh and the reason for seeking the variance take take that section out and that will cover us on the in case of emergency uh there will be no requirement for the 10 day prior submission Uh, and then just moving a little bit further on to the attachment sections uh, requiring uh, basically adding a section regarding ground source heat pumps and geothermal wells uh, require that all geothermal walls are you know defined by mass general, general law and you know meet the code etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's a there's a big uh, boilerplate section in there on geothermal that, that we can include in this too um, so those are all the notes. Those are all the notes we had on the well regs. So happy to go around the board and uh, take some comments and questions and bring you back a, a, a red line copy of what we discussed tonight. So we'll start with um, Dan Kane. Um, what if you could share the notes from Jim? Just so we can kind sure. of go through what his notes are with what's the proposed, what's the the model and just kind of see where he's thinking and where just we can read through it. Um, I'll have to look at the variance piece again. I certainly understand the need to address emergency access. I think if we're going to do that, we need to clarify what that means, what exactly constitutes an emergency, because mm -hmm. it's amazing how many things can suddenly become an emergency when they, they might not necessarily be. Just what does that mean? Because theoretically, in that case, um, everything's an emergency. Somebody's If somebody's well fails, it's an emergency. It's that yeah. simple. So therefore, it takes out all of this process and now they can dig their well, they can plug it in, they can hook it all up before doing anything else. And then therefore, why do we have breaks? If that makes sense. I mean, yeah. so that kind yeah. of mindset, it's, it's, I'm not trying to look for the worst possible scenario, but I'm also trying to make sure that we are maintaining our due diligence as a regulatory body. Um, no, you're right, Dan, because that that then leaves you only new construction and right. everything else. Yep, right. Because it was emergency, so we put it in, and now it's in. So we can't say, well, you can't use it because now it's an emergency again. So that piece of, you know, we always, just like Title V, the rules are the rules, and they're there for a reason, and there's smart engineering. And the goal is always to be as close to them as possible in every situation. And sometimes you can't be, hence the variance process. Um, it looks like in this case, the variance is for variances. So if they simply come forward to our, our health agent, whoever that is, and say, hey, my well has failed. Talk to the well guy. Here's my proposal. I don't need any variances. That is complete youth in our health agent's authority to go. No variances. It meets the requirements. It meets all the rules. Here's my stamp. Knock yourself out. Let me know when it's ready so we can test your water and just give you a permit. Um, if there's a variance, then certainly I think any of us is going to make sure that it comes before us. I can't imagine. Um, certainly if we communicate it that, you know, if it's two days before a board meeting and someone comes forward and say, hey, I, my well's failed. I need a variance. We're not going to say, sorry, 10 days. So we'll see you in two and a half weeks at our next meeting. I can't imagine that we, that we would do that. I'm not sure how to rephrase that variance piece so that no, you still should get a variance. It shouldn't be. An, I, I hate after the fact variances because yeah. if we can avoid them, if we can anticipate them and avoid them, that's I think the best thing. Um, so maybe get rid of the 10 days piece or something. I, I'm not quite sure what the language should be. I think we'll have to play with it a little bit, but I don't think simply getting rid of the need for board approval of a variance is a, yeah. is probably the best choice. So maybe it's in the case of emergency, the board may call an emergency quorum. Yep. Same as we would for anything else. I mean, whether yeah. it's, you know, a health crisis or a restaurant or whatever going, hey, we, we just lost the, the, the brand new septic line going from the common to the high school just broke. And now we've basically shutting down the center. What do we do? What can we do? What's our, what's our workaround here? What can we get approval for to allow? all those businesses to, okay, we're pumping our systems or something until we can get this fixed. 
bad example. But that kind of piece, same as we would for any other emergency. We're calling an emergency meeting. We're bypassing the 48-hour open meeting law because that's why it's there. That's why that piece is there for unforeseen circumstances. That mm -hmm. I can't imagine with our list of, I think it was what, 150 or 200 wells, give or take, right now in town, that it would come up very often that we'd have to call an emergency meeting for this. But if we need to, we need to. That's what we're here yeah. for. So I would just hate to see this come out and have have the various process basically no longer exist and have someone just be able to to, to, to yes. put it in without ever applying and then come after the fact going, oh, my thing failed over the weekend. So I put a new well in on Sunday afternoon. I paid overtime. And now, oh, by the way, you have to approve it. Yeah. Well, it's very, very forward looking and practical uh, recommendation you're making there. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, so we'll Uh, Matt Wayson, questions, comments? Yes, indeed. Um, kind of highline um, section eight of this entire document is called water quality testing requirements, which comes immediately after section seven, which is called water quantity requirements. Yep. And I'm, I'm a little hung up on the fact that they called it water quantity requirements and not water quality requirements. They specifically put the word testing in there. And it's a lot of information about what testing needs to be done. But then the only real meat is the very last point in there, number 13, that generally says, oh, and by the way, private drinking well water must meet all current Massachusetts primary and secondary drinking water standards and guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the board may take action, but not limited to requiring the property owner to provide an alternative source of drinking water. Um, a piece of me is not wild about the kind of stepping around any sort of requirements for treatment or calling it out more clearly. Um, a, a piece of me feels like in section eight, uh, where it talks about before selling, you have to test the water. I, I'm, I'm really, really feeling that this should fall closer to how we deal with Title V systems, where if you want to sell your property and your system fails, you, you can't really just sell it. It, you have to fix the problem first. And I would love to have further discussion, not necessarily right this instant, um, to say that if your well water does not meet requirements and it is your source of drinking water, then you, seller, really need to have it fixed before you sell. Um, doing a test and filing a test and then selling it to a new property owner who then doesn't have the time to put in any remediation systems and it falls off our radar it means that we as a board of health have a new owner in our community drinking well water that is identified as unsafe. Um, and won't get tested again until it's until it, the property transfers again. Right. It, oh, oh, a year later, because we'll be keeping really good track of that because we'll right, Like we'll have to be keeping track of the, of the private wells because they're all required to get it tested once a year and file it with us according to this document, which I like that piece of it. Well, not, not the, it would not require it to get tested once a year according to this document, only the rental, rental properties. Uh, if, you ch if you change that language. Right. Right. So, so I think that's a discussion point of, if you're gonna require annual testing, who should it apply to? only rental properties or all residents. And then if it's either one of those, I also feel like there needs to be a piece in there that is cognizant of whatever systems you have in place. So when you do water testing, it has to be at the source, not post treatment. So mm -hmm. if you come test my water today, it'll fail like it does every single time. But that's why I have water treatment in place. But it seems a little odd that I'm gonna have to submit to you, the board, me, and say, oh, my water failed again. And then tell you once again that I'm treating it and it's okay. So I don't know how to word it, but I feel like there has to be some call out that if you have, if you have some sort of treatment, then there needs to be a combination of submitting your water test report, plus the fact that this is what you've, you've addressed your drinking water source. I have a reverse osmosis unit. Oh, okay, check. 
we don't really care that it failed anymore because we know your drinking water is safe. Provided, here's another asterisk, that that system is being serviced properly. So it becomes a multi-layer where uh, I like testing requirements. Great. But I also respect that you, if you've put systems in place, you should be able to say, I have a system in place. Oh, and by the way, my system is maintained per the manufacturer's suggested mm -hmm. recommendations. Therefore, you know, don't bother me anymore. Um, so I think, I feel like that kind of, the, we need to add some more meat about treatment systems mm -hmm. that includes, uh, proving that those are being serviced properly so that your water is still safe. Or the other thing you do is you allow people to submit two tests, one of which is the source and one of which actually is post-treatment yeah. because everybody Good always tries to do it at the source, but but I'm drinking post-treatment. So isn't that the test I should really actually be providing because that's what we're consuming? All depends where the water comes from. If it comes from the well, that's your responsibility. But if it comes from the town, they have responsibility to make sure that water, the water that we drink from them, they are responsible to make sure they take care of it. Oh yeah, this is, and this, yeah, you know, this is all private well that I'm talking about. Um, but then, but then, to ta thank you for bringing it up, because then I have another point of uh, just spur the conversation again, not necessarily right this moment, but what about the property where um, a new construction or replacement where public water is available? And as a board, do we feel like that should raise the bar for approval to say, hold on, you want to put a well in but you have town water running down your street that you could access. Right. I, I don't know how I feel about it, but again, like looking at Title V stuff, if you've got town sewer available, you don't get to put a new septic tank in. You have, if you fail, you're connecting to town sewer. Right. And I don't, I, you know, I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> That's why I throw it out there. And it might be further conversation for our next meeting, but to say, do, do we want something about that? Once town water is available, is it our responsibility as a board to strongly encourage you to connect to that? Because we know that the testing will be more robust. Yeah, but the question is, uh, low, access? when the, 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 the person that owns the property and he says, sure, I can connect it on the local. The question is, I have a well that is available to me, not for drinking, but for waiting for, waiting for, the, for the flowers, stuff like that. And yep. if you say no, they will take you to court and say he has the right to have the well, not for drinking, but for where for whatever purpose he needs it for. Oh, I agree. I agree, Gino. It would just change the definition of that property's well from a drinking water well to an irrigation right. well. Right, right, right. And as long as you've done that formally, you'd say, fine, you can of course you can keep your well for irrigation, but now that you have access to town water, that's where you need to source your drinking water. Right. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I mean, so something as simple as, you know, no new well should be, shall be constructed uh, when municipal water is available on the street. You know, so something something like that. Um, like I said, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a big step. I mean, I I don't what, think why would anybody want to drill a well when there's town water in the street? Right. Well, I, town water costs money. Yeah, so does treating all the PFAS in your well. Right. Yep. Um. And then my last piece, uh, this is more of just, uh, hmm, um, love the whole section on quantity about the pump volumes. I guess I just have, you know, zero way to evaluate this. And I'm wondering if there's anything we can do, like collect some data from companies that have put wells in so that we understand, I don't know, even, even it's just a, a smattering of tests to say, here are 20 wells that are in Littleton that actually we know have no problem meeting these requirements. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I don't know if these are hard numbers to hit in our area. I don't know how to ask that. I assume when one is put in that. I mean, so, so you, know you can, you can get to the required levels by adding storage. Right. That's how they get to the quantity piece of it. So during high usage times, 
you know, you, you store it, you know, during the nighttime, you pump all this water out, you put it in a holding tank so that during the daytime, you get the required quantity as per this table. Um, that, that's okay, good. that makes sense. Um, other than that, I, these numbers, you know, don't mean, don't mean that much to me. Otherwise, that, that's just what they're telling me that it's sufficient. Cool. Um, I think those were the only comments I had. Thanks so much for your work on this. I, I, I like this as a start. I'm glad the state has it and we can use this as our yeah. springboard yeah, it's nice that they in a big way. Uh, Kevin Davis, questions, comments? Yeah, uh, totally. Um, first thing, the agricultural um, irrigation, uh, thank you for remembering to put that in there. Uh, we definitely want to reach out to our agricultural commission as yeah. well to make sure that whatever we're doing doesn't hurt abate issues for our farmers that are in town and things like that. So that's number one. Uh, irrigation wells. I absolutely like the requirements on the irrigation wells. Um, I don't think we need to be aerosolizing um, E. coli or any one of those other fun things that we're testing yeah. for. Uh, and so I, I think that should stick around. I'll be, I'll, you know, as far as the conversation with everybody, I'm all up for the conversation. No problem. Um, geothermal definitely you don't want to have open loop uh we want to definitely do closed loop in town i don't see a need for having dual use at all uh we should absolutely remove the requirements for any of the testing or any of the water quality or quantity or anything like that for when they drill a well for closed loop geothermal period end of statement mm -hmm. they're, they're just just have the exception it's like, never getting out like it's it's just yeah, yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just like, don't even bother. Yeah. <laughs> because there've been, well, there've been a couple of towns where they didn't put that exception in and people are having to pay all kind of money for tests and stuff like that, that aren't even part of the thing. So that's there. Um, as far as testing goes, um, I think the section's pretty weak as far as enforcement. It just says, oh, here's a test. Thank you so much. It doesn't actually say hey you're supposed to go like fix it um which which i'm like hello unless that's in a different section i just didn't see the connection i no, so kevin i mentioned that it's at the very last number 13 in that section then just yeah, has a blanket I, and by the way all of the drinking water must meet requirements period yeah i i <sighs> well section 14 it, has a penalty section. A person who violates any provision of these regulations fails to comply with the final order of the board, yada, yada. Um, fine not less than 10 or no more than $500 each day's failure to comply with the final order or any provision of the regs constitutes a separate violation. So if someone does not test their well, and we've given them plenty of reminders going, you know, okay, 30 days past when it was due, we are now ordering this, the test to be in compliance. Every day it's a failure. It falls under our standard every day is a violation penalty that exists across all of our regulations. So, I mean, there is a financial penalty. We also, as a board can basically condemn the well and say, this well is not in compliance. You are, it is not been tested. It is not in compliance. We're condemning your well. Your house is now, unless you have a secondary source of potable water, not habitable. You know, the same way we would do for a septic system that is beyond pumpable or, or anything else. This house is simply not not this this dwelling is not habitable. It has no potable water. We need to address this issue. Now, obviously, we never want to get that deep into an enforcement action, but I mean, there it's there is simply it's one paragraph. It's one item under fourteen, but it does basically refer all of these things come back to. So they didn't put penalties into each section because, as a regulation, here is our penalties for failure to follow the the regulation yeah okay I, I i i hear you um i think that makes sense from that perspective i just want to make sure that there's i just have to chew on it a little bit more dan to and uh, matt to make sure that i understand that hey all of this testing is required right i'm, I'm just i i just want to make sure that that's there um matt's no, comment I, I agree with you and kevin i think it's i think it might just be enough to change water quality testing requirements to water quality requirements 
Because that, that is the section where at the very end, it does say water must meet requirements. It, you're, but you're right. It doesn't say you have to treat it. It just says water must meet requirements and the board can do a lot of things if it doesn't, which right. might be sufficient language. But the fact that the section is called testing requirements to me bypasses the whole point that it's like, no, no, this section shouldn't be about testing requirements. It's testing that gets you to providing safe water, water quality, period. Right. Yeah, so um, I also uh, want to um, bomb on to what Matt's talking about um, as far as how you address the problems with your water and then having to test post-treatment. Um, we absolutely should be testing and reporting on post-treatment uh, because, as Matt said, um, you, you, know, you have bad water. Okay, great. You, we told you that you have bad water. Now tell me that your treatment is actually creating potable water. And I would even, I would even say that the, treat, uh, that the testing requirements post-treatment should be a yearly requirement for people who have wells. Right. Uh, because we don't, we're not, there's, I mean, I understand you want a private well, get it, got it, or your, or your thing has a private well, or your house or property has a private well, but we want to make sure that you abide by the manufacturers, you're replacing the appropriate filters, you're getting it checked, you know, all those kinds of things, you're, and you're running a test, because otherwise, you don't know if it's meeting those standards, right? So that's the reason why I would definitely say we need to have uh, some sort of a yearly testing requirement for it. I mean, the public well, I know there are different requirements for public wells, I get it, but still they're testing it and making sure that things are good for that. So that's there. Um, my final comment um, in this, uh, before we have you know more comments and things like that and see what the, the uh, um, uh, changes are with red lines, um, I don't want to remove i want to better define emergency and i want to better define um i don't want to take the teeth out from that 10-day thing i really don't um i agree with dan we've got we can hold emergency meetings we have ways of getting quorum okay so i so that's it for me yeah and it sounds to me like we're talking about requiring uh an, an annual test of all private drinking water wells in town with potentially a requirement of an operation and maintenance agreement that would provide further annual testing of, of, of treated water or just a uh a reevaluation that things are things are still potable and healthy is that the the sense that i'm getting yeah i think i mean i would say if if you're doing the annual testing of- Because I'll try and get some language from Jim and put this in here. Yeah, I think if you're testing post-treatment, then maybe you don't need language that you're following manufacturer requirements because the, it can get expensive. And frankly, if the system's working fine, the system's working fine if you can prove it. Um, yeah. So I would kind of lean towards maybe just saying, as, as long as you're testing it and it looks good, then- your system's working as best we can. Um, otherwise, people really get stuck in, I mean, it costs hundreds of dollars to get that stuff serviced every year and yeah. is it necessarily appropriate or... Um, and then should we, should we take a quick little straw poll about how people feel about all properties or just rentals, basically? Because we've bantered that around a little bit. I mean, I think it's better for the public health of the residents of Littleton if we test all the wells, the private wells that are in use, or at least have a sense of what the levels are so that, really just so that the, the people that are drinking it know what they're drinking. That is true. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would, I wouldn't want to go, I wouldn't want to go any more than, say, two years on a test every other year. Um, I think two years is good because it's like I'm, pumping I'm your septic. Me. You know, it's like you pump your septic and you check yeah. your water. Yeah, I that's, that's I'm on again. I know I don't have a private well, so I I don't 
um, have a sense for that. If we're just, you know, hey, go to test, blah, 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 every two years, yada, 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 report it. You know. Well, you know, and we and we should also, and uh, you know, I forgot to mention this before, but not only should we bring in, you know, the agricultural commission on this discussion once we get a little bit closer to having a, a final version of a document or, or final, you know, a, a rough rough draft, whatever you want to call it, uh, but also, you know, talk to LWD about these regs and you know how they might help out with testing, um, you know, for maybe a reduced cost or you know help help one hand talk to the other into the equation because I'm sure they, I mean, they're, they're, they're wealth of knowledge and, uh, and, you know, they might even help us sort of identify where water is in the street uh, in relation to some of these wells they may test on the, on the, on the wrong side of the scale type of thing. Um, and I think we lost Kevin, but that, but. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thought if you say like, if, if somebody's doing a good job of, monitoring the tests it would be really awesome if you basically went down a geographic area and staggered all the tests so that i'm testing in june my neighbor's testing in august their mm -hmm. neighbor's testing in october you know that kind of thing because you could paint a potential picture of saying if something pops up at one property you potentially could notify other people nearby that they might have a new problem yeah that's good idea. it could be really interesting if you conglomerate that data in yeah. areas mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Kevin, you're back. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, I'll, I'll put together an uh, updated document, redlined, and get it in front of everybody probably by Monday. Uh, with some language in here and on that maybe we can by then test out our, our one drive and see how see how things are working with a with an edit um so if there's no other questions or comments on that uh we can um move forward to the id decision support tool um 7 30 matt I'm hoping you can share your screen Are you muted? Can't hear you, Matt. Oh, All right, from the top. Uh, <laughs> so now, good thing. Last time, XBB 1.116 is a predominant variant at 73%, followed by, uh, sorry, 1.5, followed by 1.16 at about 12%. Um, obviously, our two-week case counts are very low. We've hit zero again for the May 4th time period. And... Um, uh, ICU bed access is 71%. Our CDC level is low still, and our up-to-date vaccinations is going to be red for a long time. It's changing a tenth of a percentage point every two weeks, basically. Uh, the wastewater levels have, have really hovered right around 200 or below uh, for the past at least month or so. So um, obviously the World Health Organization has, is no longer calling COVID a global health emergency. Um, it's here, it's gonna still be here. It's not going away, it hasn't gone away. It becomes something uh, that's more endemic, like influenza. And um, I think people still need to just make sure that they understand the importance of vaccination. I don't know what that timetable will look like moving forward, but it wouldn't surprise me if we just have an annual COVID vaccination or every six month kind of COVID vaccination. Um, I'm still disappointed that our number of up to date is below 40% because that's not kind of expressing a concern about the disease. Unlike influenza, it's not, it hasn't shown quite that seasonal peak. Um, we've had spring outbreaks and we've had summer problems. We've had problems all year round. Um, so moving forward, I think it's going to become uh, more apparent as to maybe it will be a more seasonal thing, but if not, we just still just, People need to stay vaccinated. Get vaccinated so you don't have to worry about it for a while. And then as new guidelines come out or new vaccinations come out, you'll be able to continue to get those. So uh, that's what I got. Very good.
Thank you very much. Public hearing board of health elections and appointments. Uh, I wanted to first uh, recognize uh, Mr. Gino Fredoloni for uh, winning another term uh, at the town elections this past weekend. That's Congratulations, Gino. Welcome thank back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I wasn't present the 26th because I was in Arizona. I was supposed to be a home to 26. Instead, I got on this 27. And, it, and it, we had to get up 3 30 to go to the airport. And then we got there. Uh, we got here. We stopped in four different directions, and uh, I got home about one thirty in the morning. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I meant to be on the twenty sixth too, but I missed you guys. That's all. Well, you're here now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and it is a annual. Uh, after the town elections, uh, the board reorganizes. Um, so at this board members, and I'm, I'm going to make a motion uh, to nominate uh, Dan Kane as the chair of the Littleton Board of Health for this year, or maybe maybe moving forward. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Motion in the second. Roll call of vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fedeloni. Yes. Uh, Dan Kane. Yes. And Matt Wason. <laughs> Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Thank you for your service, Mr. Kane. <laughs> And does anyone have a motion for um, vice chair? If if not, I will make the motion uh, to nominate Matt Wason as the as the vice chair. Second. Littleton Board of Health. Um, a motion and a second. A roll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis. Yes. Dan Kane. Dan Kane, yes. Gina Fratelloni. Yes. Gina Fratelloni, yes. Wilson. yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Um, I want a motion for the clerk. Does anyone have a motion for a clerk? I will. I will make a motion uh, to not. Dan, Dan had one. Uh, Did Dan have one? Oh. Dan had one. All right. Uh, I will make a motion to nominate Gino Fratelloni as the clerk. Uh, it's a little too board of health. Second. <laughs> uh, motion is second. We have a roll call vote. Uh, Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fratelloni. I guess I have no choice. You guys don't don't love me no more. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, Dan Kane. Dan Kane, yes. And Matt Wason. Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes us. All right. And if we could have more more roles, we would uh, continue <laughs> to work hard together and uh, keep doing the best we can for the public health of the residents of Littleton. Uh, uh, meeting minutes approval. Moving on, we have the July 13th meeting minutes. Anyone have a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes of July 13, 2022, as presented. I'll second. Uh, okay, you beat me to it. <laughs> uh, Gino, you were absent for the meeting. Oh, I was. Okay. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Uh, Gino Fratelloni, uh -huh. abstain. I can't, I can't because I wasn't there. You got to abstain, yeah. Uh, Dan Kane. Dan Kane, yes. 
Matt Wason? Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker wrote yes. And we also have the April 20. So it was a draft. And then in January. Corrections read through this. Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from April 26 as, as presented on May 9th. I'll second. Motion and second. We'll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fratelloni. What, what, what date was it? 26? Oh, you eight? weren't at that one either. Yeah. You have to abstain I, from that. I was in Arizona. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, Dan Kane. Dan Kane, yes. Matt Wason. Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Uh, Mr. Baker, on the 13th, you were absent. Uh, oh. July? Oh. <laughs> this is April 26th. April 26th. Oh, April 26th. I'm sorry. I thought we were on July 13th. <laughs> we did that already. Oh, got it. Roger that. Um, moving on. Any correspondence? Does anyone have anything? Board member updates. Else? I'm not oh. sure if it's just me or not, but Kevin, you're really breaking up. I'm not sure if it's my yeah, connection yeah, it's or yours. Says it's, a, it's unstable. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's gotten it's gotten pretty bad. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know what you heard last, but I, I was just saying all we need is a motion to adjourn. Oh, before we, um, administrative matter, if I can, Mr. Chair, um, I know we've asked this in the past. Uh, is there any way? I think yes. that kind of came out again tonight. Is somebody? I think froze. we lost them. <laughs> oh, actually, Dan, you're you're the chair now, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Um, uh, we've I know we've asked about this in the past. Um, I kind of came up tonight with the what exactly was being requested for the variance that we get our plans and letters from engineers. We right. never actually see the application right. that's presented, which lists property owner, what exactly what waivers are being requested. I think that might be helpful, a little bit easier for us to know exactly what's being requested rather than trying to find and throw it to line, your right. line 18 in the construction notes of what they're looking for or hope that the, some of the letters from the engineers are great and clearly yeah. describe what they're looking for what waiver or what regulation they're requesting and and some are um are less precise in their language can which can provide confusion i had the same piece tonight of that you know the the butter notified because they were doing a wall within the within the property line that was i think an understandable confusion that I had. And I think Matt had the same piece of it looked like there was work within 10 feet, hence the about a notification that piece. And it wasn't clearly defined someplace else of this is what we are asking for other than in Jim's notes. Jim's notes are great, but if an engineer is coming before us, they should know what they're asking for. And then Jim can say, you, you also need this, this, and this update your application or, or we recognize it, but, It'd be nice if we'd actually get that that documentation, which they, they're required to submit. It'd be nice if we could get that as well. And perhaps that's something Brenda can work with Jim as we are getting hearings coming forward. Just include the application form, whether it's electronic or paper, in the packet with their engineering letter and the plans. Do you want to do you want to ask Jim to make sure that's forwarded to us? That'd be a good idea. What's the pleasure of the board? Yes. Well, 
I agree with what you're asking for. I agree there needs like we have piece A and piece C or this B in the middle. Um, so I, I'm asking specifically, do you want to just say, Jim, can you forward that along to us? Or is it, do we need to make sure that the engineer is is providing us with that information? I guess, wh which answer do you want? The application that Jim has or a properly formatted letter from the engineer expressly stating what they're asking? I think they uh, Go ahead, Gino. Sorry. I, I, I think I would want the application that they've submitted. They're also going to submit their letter of request and their plans as they do now, but they're also, they're already doing the paperwork to make a formal request. Yeah. Here's, here's who, where I'm doing it, who I'm doing it for, who I am, what requests I'm making. Here's my license number, all that great stuff on a piece of paper or electronically, along with their letter of request for hearing. And those are the pieces um, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, there should be an application for, a variance or an application for an approval that already exists through through Jim's office in the Shoba. That that seems like something that we should be able to get without adding a significant workload to anybody's plate. But that just makes sure that we're all clear on on all of it and that and kind of tag team with that. Uh, it's hard virtual. Uh, I know in, in a past life that as soon as the engineer came before our board in person, here's my plans. If you don't have copies of the plans, I have copies of the plans for everybody. And here's my my paper clip with all my green cards for my mm -hmm. certified receipt, return receipts from all my butter notifications. So the question was asked tonight of, have you done that? Well, I think so. I think I turned it in. That's a, a little weak that I'm, I'm, I hope you did too. But mm -hmm. it is, again, I think they, I think it's been done, but it's nice to know that we can actually, that there was a butter notification requirement that it has been done and that we can't control those cards coming back, but at least we know because someone chooses it'll be not to pick up their their card and sign it, then it doesn't come back. But making sure that, that loop is closed as well, that the butters were notified and not they oh yeah, they should have been. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. May, I, inter may, may I interrupt, please? For, uh, of course. Of course. Again. Um there was a butter notifications and that was sent to me, and the green cards were sent to me. So I do perfect. have perfect. All right. No, thank you, Brenda. And certainly, yeah, I, 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 I think I speak for the board. We say if the engineer can't remember when, or, you know, the, the petitioner can't remember if they've done it or not, and you're aware, we're, we're happy to hear that. Cause that's, that's our only concern is we don't, we're no, we don't care where the data comes from as long as it's reliable. And if you're saying, Nope, I got green cards back for picking an address, then that, you know, works for us. It just, it, it yeah. closes that loop and we know and we've, we've met that requirement. Reasons. I have the mailing receipts as um, also, so he did send them to me. I did Great. not include them in the packet, but I do have them, and they were sent to me. So yeah. if I if I could throw it out there, then procedurally, Brenda, this is just right to you. Would you like? Would it be okay? Would you like us to, in a situation like that, prompt you with a question saying, Brenda, do you have any detail on X? What they're talking about, or would you like to? just hop on and ask us to interrupt or what, what would be best for how you work? Because you've got the knowledge. We, we shouldn't ignore you, but how best do you want us to uh, prompt that? Um, I guess as a board, however you choose, I could either put it in the uh, meeting packet with the letter. Um, I will say that that letter um if I'm, I think we're talking about Mark Mark El Elbag, if I'm not mistaken. His letter was a little sparse, but normally the letters that do come in have the A, B, C, and D of the who, yep. what, where, and why. Um, and then I do get the um, about notifications. I get the green cards, and I do get the receipts actually as well. And Brenda, I'm asking more paperwork and packet aside. Once we're live in this meeting, if you have pertinent information that you want to provide to us i'm saying would you do you feel comfortable interrupting us because i think if you if you do great or would you like us to pause and say gosh we feel some pieces are missing brenda do you have anything to add that's what i'm shooting for either either way is fine um i i, I don't normally interrupt because i don't know if i could if, <laughs> per se so i want to just make sure that uh, procedurally we're going through what we're supposed to so either way would be fine for me in that case, I would say, if everybody else agrees, if there's something pertinent, please feel free to interrupt. 
Uh, but I think at the same time, we should also feel comfortable if there's a situation like that, pausing whoever's running the meeting, Mr. Chairperson, to say, hey, Brenda, do you have any details about these missing pieces? As Have you seen any? Sounds good. Thank you. I wish there was a way that all of us could have an account on the open gov thing where all of these nice pieces of data are going to be put. Oh, oh, do we have a project for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Since Kevin's still breaking up a little bit, we're, yeah, we're continuing to move down the road of open gov and what that's going to look like. And Kevin and I talked today about learning more about the system and what that will look like. Um, as to all of us having accounts, that's questionable. There's a significant cost in the system, but I hear what you're saying. And so we are definitely pushing to go down that to see what we'll have access to and will we be able to get some of this information directly. So while I, while I appreciate the costing side of things and things like that, um, it may reduce the workload on our admin because that data has to be in there anyway. And if we're trained appropriately to get the data, I know we've got to produce a packet to give to the public. I get that. I understand that. Um, yeah. Okay. Never mind. I'm, I'm, I'm like working through it as I'm, I'm speaking and things are going backwards in my brain. So I, yeah, heard and we'll, we'll push for it. The cost yeah. of the thrown out was astronomically high. So if it makes sense, we'll do it. I'll, yeah, the cost doesn't, okay, whatever. I'll, I, I want to understand why the cost is astronomically high for, anyway. I, for read only access, I, it just doesn't make sense. We'll, we'll get more information. Like I said, this was just early, early discussion. So we'll figure out what we can and can't do. Yeah. Okay. Any other board member comments, updates? Uh, if nothing else, I think we just need to be a moment to a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Can anyone? Second. Thank you. I'll second. <laughs> Roll call vote. Kevin Davis. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Nice seeing you, Ben. Dan Kane? Dan Kane, yes. Matt Wason? Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Uh, thank you guys for everything tonight. Uh, thank you, Brenda. Thank you.